This is a production of PBS Charlotte. The following episode of Charlotte Cooks is brought to you by Central Piedmont Community College and viewers like you. Thank you. Coming up on this episode of Charlotte Cooks, we're turning up the heat with these beauties. Hi there, and welcome to this edition of Charlotte Cooks. I'm Chef Pamela Roberts, and joining me in my kitchen today is Chef Shai Fargian. Yes. Did I say that right? Yes. <laughs> I love your name. Um, you are from Yafo Kitchen, and he is here today to share with us some of the delicious, wonderful foods and flavors that we have coming out of the Mediterranean. If you like food that is full of flavor, you're going to enjoy today's show. So, Shai, tell us what we're going to make today. So today we're going to make something that really represents me and kind of where I grew up in, in Israel, and where I've been living in the last almost 10 years, which is the south of the United States. So we're going to make my version of an Israeli hot chicken, which is a play on the uh, Nashville hot chicken. Mm -hmm. um, and a play on fried chicken too. Yes. So first we're going to make the actual chicken. So we're going to pound and marinate the chicken. And then we're going to make the, I would say, condiment. We're going to put tzatziki in it because it's really spicy. We've got to mm. cool it down. And then we're going to make a red schug, which is our hot sauce that we put on the sandwich, which makes it hot. And then we're going to make a beautiful purple cabbage slaw, which uh, sounds southern, but it's actually very common in Israel as well. It so sounds delicious. So it's kind of a mesh up of everything. The thing I'm afraid of is that sauce you said. Now, how do you say that? All right. Uh, schug. It's actually a Yemenite condiment. Okay. And we have green and red versions. The green one is more mild. We use uh, jalapenos. And then the red ones, we're going to use our habaneros. That's where we're so, turning up the heat. Yes. <laughs> oh, boy. And I can't wait to get started. I'm going to talk about why we're doing schnitzel and what makes schnitzel Israeli. As most people know, schnitzel is uh, Eastern European. Austrian, German. In the 40s, a lot of Jews left uh, Eastern Europe and came to Israel. Originally, schnitzel is made with uh, pork um, or veal, and they couldn't get it in Israel in the 40s and 50s. Also, there's a kosher aspect to it, right. uh, and chicken was the only option for them. So all these Jews that came from Eastern European to Israel started making chicken schnitzel, and it's kind of rooted in the country's uh, food DNA. Mm -hmm. and uh, if you'd ask me what is the most Israeli food, and it's a mesh-up of culture, I would say a chicken schnitzel and a pita with hummus and Israeli salad. Let's get started. All right, so we have our beautiful chicken breast here, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna butterfly it in order to uh, pound it and make it a little thinner. I'm gonna flip it, so you wanna put the skin side down, and then kind of with your hand, rub it to make it flat. Uh, there is the tenderloin right here, and then there's the rest of the chicken breast. And we want to cut it in one cut that will make two even pieces. So what I'm doing is I'm flattening it with my hand, and then I'm going to use from the bottom of my knife all the way to the top to make a clear cut. So I'm going to do it this way. And then halfway about halfway through the chicken, I'm going to lift it and see if I really made it even on both so sides. So you're not trying to cut it in two pieces. You're I am going to cut it in two pieces, but sometimes because of the way the tenderloin is uh, goes farther in, you ah. might have to correct at the end. So gotcha. then I'm going to continue the cut. Okay. And you can see it's still one cut. I just had to kind of adjust in the middle. I'm going to make one more, and then we're going to pound it. So again, I'm actually moving farther from my cutting board because I want my knife to be closer to the cutting board so I can cut it uh, in one strike. I'm going to rub it just to flatten it all and I'm starting all the way from the bottom and one more cut and that's it. And you can see there's two pieces and they're both about even in thickness. Now as we cook the chicken uh, we want it all to be the same thickness yeah. and because of the natural shape of it this part will be always always be thicker than this part. Cutting the chicken also means that the chicken's going to cook a whole lot faster than doing the whole breast, right? Correct. We're going to pound it to make it uh, even in terms of thickness from the bottom part and the top part. We're going to use a plastic bag. Um, one of the sealable ones is better because they're usually thicker and when we hit it with our tenderizer it will uh, even it out. So all I did is cut the ends off, or the sides. Oh, so you opened it up. Yes. Okay. So oh, good idea. So it's easier for us to do this. And again, you always want to pound it with the skin side down, because we're going to force the tissue to move. Uh, and if you do it from this side, it's going to break 
because this is our, our smooth side. I'm gonna cover it, I'm gonna take my tenderizer, and this is my favorite part of the day. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna pound it just lightly. And you can see, and then you, you wanna put your hand on it and kind of feel where you are with the thickness. So you rub it or put your hand on it, and then I'm gonna switch to the other side because all I'm trying to do is even it out. So. Nice. There you go, and now it feels, it's the same thickness throughout the whole piece, and we can take it and move to our next piece. It also made it bigger, which is much more impressive. Yeah, it looks like you're getting a lot more to yeah. eat. So this side, there's no skin side, it's the inner part, but you still wanna use the part where the blade touched, that's gonna be your, uh, the, pow the part that you're pounding. Now, can you explain a little bit as to why you would choose the waffle side or the flat side of your pounder? The top of of the chicken is much thicker. And with that part, we really need to break the tissue. And the other part is much thinner, and all we're trying to do is put some force on it to spread it around. So I'm gonna use, I'm gonna do one more. I'm gonna use the uh, waffle part, or the part with almost the spikes, just on the top to break down the tissue. But not on the bottom, because but not that on the break bottom. it up because it's gonna tear it. Right. And then I'm gonna flip it and use this much more gently. And you see, I, I'm not hitting it. Yeah, I'm we're just not wailing kind of, into yes. it like all of your aggression. Yes, I'm just kind <laughs> of, you know, letting the weight of the uh, tenderizer do it, its own job. So Shai, now we're gonna make the marinade for the chicken. Tell us what's in that marinade. When you make a marinade for anything, especially something chicken that's kind of bland by itself, mm -hmm. you want the flavor to be ramped up. You want it to be almost like the final flavor that you want, but on steroids. You want it to be almost unedible uh, because you're gonna lose so much of it. Not everything's gonna penetrate into the chicken right. and you're gonna lose some of it in the cooking process into your oil or your grill or whatever. So we're gonna make a marinade that's gonna be very acidic and very herbaceous and a lot of uh, pepper flavor to it uh, and a lot of salt. So we're gonna start with half of a jalapeno Take the seeds out uh, already? Seeds out. We don't want the heat, we just want the flavor. Salt, a lot of salt. That's it's a lot of be, salt. It is. It is just for a marinade. It's not the actual salt in the final product. Correct. So don't have a heart attack. No. <laughs> and then this amount of marinade is good enough to marinate a whole lot of chicken. Um, this should marinate 10 pounds of chicken. So you could actually so. save this marinade? You could freeze it maybe? Yep, okay. you can definitely freeze it. Um, we make it every day in the restaurant, but uh, because it's such strong flavor and because we're gonna bread it, uh, a lot of the marinade is gonna come off the chicken. So uh, we don't want all the flavor, so we can just use a little bit. Now you just added some garlic. garlic. And then we're gonna do some lemon juice. And you can see the way I'm holding the lemon is with the uh, cut side up. That way I'm catching all the seeds in my hand. There you go. And I'm just letting the juice drip. One last one. So that's juice of two lemons you put in uh, there? Yes. It's really important to use lemon, uh, fresh squeezed lemon. And then the next thing we're gonna add more liquid is olive oil. And we use extra virgin for this because we do want the flavor out of that. And we're gonna fry it in uh, canola oil at the end. And water, just because otherwise it gets a little too thick. And why does it get too thick? Is because we're gonna add a whole bunch of herbs into it. We're gonna do half a bunch of parsley. Now does it matter if you use flat leaf parsley or curly leaf parsley? Uh, not for this application because we're going to puree it anyway and the flavor is very similar. For most raw preparations, if you're just going to chop parsley, personally uh, I use flat leaf Me and too. that's what we use in all the yeah, alpha restaurants because that's what they have in Israel. It's also easy to cut it yep. because it's not curly. And then now you're putting in big handfuls of cilantro yes. and you're including the stems in both of these things yes. too. Especially in cilantro, every time we go to cut it, the stem in the cilantro has a lot of flavor to it and had yes, it does. Uh, great scent to it. The parsley stem doesn't have as much flavor, but because we're pureeing it completely, we can put the whole thing in. So now, very important with all blenders is to start low and, wrap, and bring it up a little <laughs> yeah, bit. Yeah, don't want it on your ceiling. Yes. <laughs> and that's it. This is our garlic herb smoothie. Mmm, yum. Give me a glass. <laughs> Not a glass, but you can have a little taste. I'm gonna have I can have a little taste? Yes, I'm gonna taste it as well. So I could really see how strong this is. Great. Very salty, very acidic, almost unedible. 
Uh, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't want a big spoonful of that, but no. I can see how that's going to penetrate that chicken and give that chicken that flavor we're looking for. Yep, absolutely. Correct. That's what that's what we want. So now we're going to take this and we're going to marinate our chicken in a, another plastic bag. You know, you've always seen it in commercial places how they vacuum seal their uh, uh, proteins to get better pre penetration. Uh, we're going to do not vacuum seal, but very close to it in a bag. I actually like marinating in a plastic bag too because you can turn it over and you can make sure everything's in contact with the marinade instead of in a bowl where something's on top. This way you can just massage it in yeah. there. Yes. Every time we use a plastic bag, we don't want to get chicken on the seal. Uh, I'm going to roll it and hold it like this. Another thing you can do is if you have a pitcher uh, at home, you can put it into a pitcher and kind of let the pitcher hold it. Um, usually like a standard pitcher works for that. Uh, so I'm going to put a little bit of the marinade in and then I'm going to put all the chicken in. You want to make sure all the surfaces on all of that chicken is coming in contact yeah. with that marinade. And then I'm going to put a touch more marinade and you can see we made about three cups of marinade, two and a half, but we only need about half of it in here mm -hmm. because uh, so much of it is, is already covering the chicken. And you don't necessarily want it to be swimming in the marinade, you just want to need enough to coat everything generously. Yes, and because of the high salt and acid content of this marinade, uh, you would want to marinate it for at least eight hours, but never more than 32. There's so much salt and acid in this marinade that if it's there for more than 32 hours, it's actually going to cook the chicken. And really and break it down where it's mushy yes, and not very um, Almost like ceviche. Yeah, there you go. And who eats and chicken ceviche? No, nah, not, not really. Not really. Good idea. In the bag, you can move it around. You can make sure everything is touching. And because we rolled it, everything is cleaned on the nice outside. Nice and sealed tight. Yep. The next thing we're going to do right now is make the breading, which is a little different than your standard fried chicken breading. I like my chicken crispy or extra crispy, or sometimes I would say extra, extra crispy. Uh -huh. uh, in order to do that, and also in order to accommodate uh, what we do in Yaffa, which is a fast casual, about 40% of the people take the food to go. Mm -hmm. So we needed to come up with a recipe that is, uh, stays crispy even if you eat it 30 minutes later. So what we used is a really interesting combination of panko, which is Japanese breadcrumbs, and you can see that in their size, they're much bigger than regular breadcrumbs. And they're crispier when they cook too. Correct. I love panko. And then to make it even crispier, we chose cornflakes. Cornflakes are already crispy. Yes, they So are. when you fry them, they just stay crispier for longer. We did a 50-50 mix uh, of panko and cornflakes. So we're taking the cornflakes and we need to pulse it in a food processor in order to make it the same size of the panko. So if someone was, didn't have machines at home, they could just um, sort of pound it with yep, a rolling pin or something? you can pound it with a rolling pin, you can crush it with your hands in a plastic bag, whatever you need to do, but eventually we want these two things to be the same size in order to coat the chicken Good evenly. Point. So I'm going to put some in here and then close it and it's important not to do it in one run it, rather than pulse it so the stuff from the side could break down a little bit and that we don't get it too small because we still like the big chunks because big chunk stay crispier. That's it. So you see it was very quick but then you can also see how they're about the same size. We're going to put our breadcrumbs and our cornflakes And so you're looking for a 50-50 mixture? Yep, exactly 50-50. And this, you can pre-make it. And this, you don't even have to freeze it. You can just hold it in your pantry, just like that, already mixed. And then use and it as you need it. Is yeah. that, but you can't save used breadcrumbs. If you've had chicken in there, you've got to throw it away. Yes. But if you make this and you don't need it all, just use what you need. And you can see that the mixture is kind of even in color, 50-50. Mm -hmm. So we have our uh, breading mixture, and we're going to leave this here and go make the rest of our condiments, the slaw, the hot sauce, the tzatziki, and we'll come back, bread it, and fry the chicken. This is a purple cabbage slaw, okay, red purple or purple, slaw. whichever way you want to look at it. Uh, also very popular in Israel. Uh, probably came to Israel with the uh, Russian immigrants. There you that go. That had a lot of cabbage and mayonnaise, uh, mm -hmm. uh, predominant in, in Russian cuisine. So that's another way of mixing up. Uh, Germany and Austria into Russia and the Middle East. First what we're going to do is we're going to cut it really fine and then we're going to let it sit with the uh, vinegar and spices in order to pull some of the moisture out and drain it and then we're going to add the mayonnaise at the end which is really important because if you do it at the beginning 
the mayonnaise is going to get diluted and wash everything off because there's a very high water content in the cabbage. There is. And all the uh, salt and acid pulls it out of it, mm -hmm. and we don't want to wash the flavors off. Right. That's a good point to know is that cabbage does have a lot of water in it. And so you always want to try and get some of that water out or else you're just going to end up with a very watered out dressing. Yes. So what I'm going to do is cut it into quarters and then really fast chop it. Most home uh, food processors have this uh, application that can uh, the slice. shredding device, yeah, yeah. Shred it. Sometimes you can even buy shredded uh, cabbage. What we're going to do now is take all this cabbage and you see how it got much bigger because we sliced it and there's a lot of air between the uh, little shreds. I'm going to add my salt, a little bit of pepper, a touch of cumin, which adds a lot of uh, unique flavor to our slaw. You don't really get that a lot in the southern slaw. Sugar, key ingredient in any slaw in any culture. Mm -hmm. And the last touch that we have is uh, white wine vinegar. Now you can use different vinegars. You can use regular white distilled vinegar. I like to use white wine vinegar because it has more of a sweetness and it helps me we do a little less sugar and then the white wine vinegar. Uh, and what I'm doing is I'm kind of making sure it's all mixed in. And I'm really smushing it with my hands, massaging the cabbage and making sure the vinegar and the spices are all going to go into the cabbage. And by massaging it that way too, you're starting to release some of those waters and some yeah. of that liquid that's caught in there. See, look at that. That's awesome. So that's only going to sit for about five minutes or so before we... Um... Before we add the mayonnaise. Okay. Yeah. And, and then are we going to drain it? We're going to drain it because, again, we don't want to wash the uh, flavors off. It's also going to lose about 30% of its volume, mm -hmm. uh, which will be easier for us to mix the mayonnaise in. Let's get the breading done, and then while we're cooking the chicken, we'll do that what sauce? Schug. We'll do that sauce. <laughs> <laughs> this is a standard three-part breading. Um, the first part is going to be flour, mm -hmm. and then the egg is going to make the flour a little sticky. Mm -hmm. And then the breading is going to stick to the flour. And I like to do it in more of these pans because it gives you more space to push the uh, breading into it. You want to make sure that you get little bits of the breadcrumbs in between the big chunks of the panko and cornflakes. So we really want to push it in. Same with the uh, flour. So uh, I'm going to have the flour first. And it's going to go in here. And the next thing is going to be eggs. And we have two whole eggs in here. And I'm going to whisk them. And I'm actually going to add a little bit of water to it. And what the water does is it loosens up the eggs a little bit so you don't get basically scrambled eggs in your breading. And then the last thing is going to be our breading. I'm just going to put a little bit in. And I'll save this because if we're not going to use it, I can always use it a mm -hmm. different time. Mm -hmm. So pass me the chicken, please. Yeah, yeah. And we're gonna open this. This chicken has been marinating for quite a while. And remember, the marinade is so strong that we don't need that much on it. Uh, and what I'm going to do is actually take some of the marinade, rub it off. So Otherwise, we need to pat it dry a little bit? Uh, a little bit. I, all I do is actually I just kind of do this. Okay. And you can see the chicken already started mm -hmm. changing its color. That's uh, getting the acid. a little, yeah. And then it's gonna go into the flour. And we don't nice want too much coated. flour and shake it, the excess flour off and it's going to go into the eggs. Uh, ideally we do it with our hands, which I am going to do with the final part and we use the uh, wet hand, dry hand method, mm -hmm. uh, which could be sometimes confusing, but that's why I like to do it with the tongs <laughs> until the, end, the final part. So now we have the eggs on it and this is going to go in the breading and this is where you have to use your hand. What we do is we shake it a little bit and then you take the breading and you press it onto it. And we'll take more breading and we kind of want to make sure it's covered. Since pressing it in you'll see it actually grows. So the whole thing is going to be much bigger and you have to remember there's only three ounces of meat in here mm -hmm. but when you look at the final result, like you said, we have quite a nice piece of chicken. Yeah, it looks much bigger than three ounces. It is at this point ready to fry. What I like to do is let it sit for about 20 minutes or 30 minutes because it helps the um, breading stick to, to stick, it. Yes. Uh, we have a big, heavy cast iron pan. We want it to be heavy because it retains heat and it distributes it evenly. And when we put all the food in there, it's not going to drop the temperature too much. Uh, ideally, we would like our oil at 350. So we're going to take a piece of chicken, always, always, always put it in away from you. Thank you for so saying that. We're going to put it in and away. 
Um, and that way it splashes away yeah. from you instead of on you. And another one. And there's a lot of oil in here, so this is almost like deep frying. So this is going to be a really fast cook time. This shouldn't take more than three or four minutes. All right. All so right. how do you make that, that, that sauce? All right, let's get to go make our hot sauce. For extreme heat, we use our <laughs> habaneros with the seeds. All we did is took the stems off of these, and this is the first thing that's going to go in our bowl. And these are habaneros with the seeds, guys. Correct. This is mm. some serious heat. Uh, the next flavor that we're going to add is cilantro. And I'm going to take one bunch of cilantro and I'm going to rough cut it, like we said earlier, with the stems because the cilantro stems have a lot of flavor in them. So that's going to go in here. A little bit of garlic for flavor, not heat. And because this is so hot, we're actually going to add tomatoes to it to tune it down. And the tomatoes help it uh, kind of calm down the habaneros and move it around. And for flavoring, a little bit of smoked paprika, salt to enhance the other flavors, and cumin, because that's a, almost everything we make. And it has a great flavor with it. And olive oil. And that's it. All we're going to do is mix it all together. If the tomatoes are not plump enough, then we might add a little bit of water okay. just to help it circulate in the pan. Just run it for about four minutes until you can use it as a spread. So we have our chicken and we have our hot sauce. So now we need our cooling effects. So we're going to go finish our slaw and our tzatziki and we're going to build a sandwich. And you can see how much liquid has came out of this uh, cabbage. Some of it is the vinegar, but a lot of it is the actual cabbage itself. And it got much more pliable, and it lost about 30% of its volume. So what we're going to do is pour it into here. And you can see none of the spices stayed in the bowl. I want the spices. I don't want them to get washed off. And I'm going to press it a little bit just to get the rest of it out. And go back into the original bowl. And the last thing we're going to do is add our mayonnaise. So we have our slaw is ready, and our last ingredient of our sandwich will be the tzatziki. The most important thing for tzatziki is yogurt. We use Greek yogurt. We want the Greek yogurt with the highest fat percentage we can find. Uh, one that's whole milk, um, often sheep's milk is fine as well, uh, but you really need the high fat content in order to carry the flavors through. The second ingredient is going to be cucumbers. We took our cucumber, we shredded it on a box shredder, and it's really important to take all the juices off because we don't want tzatziki soup, we want tzatziki okay. sauce. Next thing, really important, is garlic. And we chopped this garlic really fine. Salt, pepper, mint. What you add in there? A little more lemon, lemon juice? juice? And two last ingredients, olive oil, which adds flavor. The last thing we're going to use is honey. So that's it. We got our tzatziki, mix it through. And again, the longer this sits, the better. This would be great tomorrow or even in a couple of hours. Let's put this together. Well, let's start with the bun. And then we're going to take some tzatziki. And that would be the first thing. And we want to really put it on both sides. That will help us get the full cooling effect. The next thing we do is we're going to take a piece of chicken. And you can see it when you fry a chicken, it's always like a rounder side or a curved side. And we want to put that side on the bottom because that would help us hold the rest of our slaw. There you go. That's a good um, tip. And then I'm going to take some of the sauce, just a little bit, and make sure we spread it evenly throughout the thing. You don't want to get to one bite of it at the end. It's kind of like if you're eating sushi and you get that bite of wasabi, sort Correct. of blows your head off. Whoosh. <laughs> <laughs> so we're spreading it all around, and you can see it's really not a big amount, but this is going to have quite a kick to it. And the last thing is, like I said, we're going to use this to hold the cabbage. So this is going to get a nice amount of slaw on it. And the top. And that's Ooh. it. And it's not really a chicken sandwich if the chicken is the same size as the bun. It really <laughs> has to be, you know, a lot bigger. It's a hot chicken sandwich inspired by Southern tradition used with the ingredients that I grew up eating and the food that I brought with me from Israel. Thank you for watching this episode of Charlotte Cooks. If you want to grab these recipes, you can get them off of our website at pbscharlotte.org or you can send me an email at pamela.roberts at cpcc.edu and we'll catch you next time on Charlotte Cooks. So thanks for watching. of PBS Charlotte.